I want to talk to you about guarding against type 1 and type 2 errors. We've discussed what they are, and I think you now understand that, uh, in a way, uh, you can only do so much to get rid of type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, but in order to understand how we might guard against them, we need to kind of understand why they happen in the first place. So one reason that type 1 errors happen, we'll start with type 1 errors, is that we set a particular alpha value where we almost guarantee that we're going to have them a certain amount of the time. And in fact, if alpha equals 0.05, and we imagine we do 100 tests, we would kind of expect, even if there was no uh, effect at all, that we would uh, commit a type 1 error 5% of the time. So in other words, the null hypothesis is true. There's no effect of x on y or no correlation or whatever it is we're looking at. And <clears throat> we would expect, if we set alpha at 0.05, to make this kind of error 1 out of 20 times that we do the test, or 5 out of 100. So this suggests one immediate way we can guard against type 1 errors, right? Um, we could solve that problem really quickly. How about setting alpha lower. So for example, if we set alpha at 0.01 and move this entire line over here so that these are no longer falling into this category, but they're falling into the great category. I should be writing that in green. But anyway, we are accepting the null, and the null is true much more often now, right? And we're rejecting the null when the null hypothesis is true only 1% of the time. So we can very easily reduce the amount of type 1 error to 1 out of 100 by simply setting alpha equals 0.01. Hey, why not do even better? Let's set it at alpha equals 0 .001. 0 .001. Then we'll only make this kind of error 1 out of 1,000 times. It's fantastic. There's a problem with this, as you can imagine. So. What's happening here are two things. First of all, notice down here, we were great, um, but we're squeezing that great box. <laughs> uh, and in this, all of these tests, when we were in fact right to reject the null, are not getting rejected anymore. And so we have a very uh, increasingly small chance of rejecting a truly false null. Um, so a lot of our tests are going to be um, saying that there's no effect when in fact there is an effect. What does that mean really? What that really means is our type 2 error space is increasing. I should put that in red, shouldn't I? Because that's not a good thing. Suddenly our type 2 errors are increasing tremendously. So while we may be minimizing type 1 errors to this little red box here, if we go to 0.01, for example, um, and this should be right on top of each other here, this red box uh, is representing the number of times we're going to be making type 2 errors. So you can see then that there's a trade-off between making type 1 and type 2 errors if we simply slide alpha to lower and lower levels. Now, in any given field, you may feel like, well, I would much rather make a type 2 error than a type 1 error. Or in some fields, you might say, well, I'd rather have them balanced. I'd rather make a type 2 error once in a while, and that's OK. And I'd rather make a type 1 error once in a while. You might even set alpha equal to 0.1, because you really don't mind making type 1 errors 1 out of 10 times. And that's because you know, you don't want to miss real if, real things. You don't want to miss ending up in the great category um, that often. But you certainly do if you set alpha really low. Okay, so that's one thing. There's a trade-off between making type 1 and type 2 errors. Simply if we change alpha, changing our, our threshold. Okay, so there's going to be a trade-off. That's one real problem. Um, and it does indicate also that how arbitrary this alpha is, right? Because 
Who says alpha has to be 0.05? No one actually. So when we perform statistical tests, we actually like to present exact p-values partly because, you know, you could set alpha at 0.05, but if you get a p of 0.011, your probability of making a type 1 error is quite a bit less. Okay, so anyway, I think um, this illustrates that point of a trade-off. So what can we do to uh, prevent type 1 errors? What else can we do? Well, let's kind of think about it with respect to a regression, for example. So if we have x and y, remember here we're making type 1 errors, so the null hypothesis is true. Um, how, could a, how could we end up in a, making a type 1 error? Well, let's imagine that we happen to sample six points, okay? And what happens is, by chance, we sample these six points, all right? Um, but the null hypothesis is actually true. Well, this analysis is going to tell us that x affects y. But the problem is, there's a small sample size. And by chance, we've picked six points that happen to produce what looks like a line. But if we were actually to increase our sample size, we would see that those six points are part of a cloud of points like this. Okay, and that there's, in fact, no relationship between x and y if we have a much larger sample size. So, um, you know, as with most <laughs> statistics, we can guard against making this kind of error by chance by increasing n. Why does this work? It works because as we increase n, so as we increase n, we're getting closer and closer to the parametric population size. And, you know, if we're trying to sample all women on Earth, for example, and we get up to 2 million, a sample size of 2 million, well, you know, we're going to have a much more representative population than a sample of 10. So one can imagine a plot of type 1 errors chance of saying there's a difference when in fact there's not, and it's going to decrease as our n increases until it finally gets to zero at the parametric n, right? Because then we'll have no error because we've eliminated uh, any difference between our sample and the parametric n. So what we find in our sample is the parametric n, and it's the truth. Okay, so um, I think you can see that uh, n, simply increasing n, is going to be helpful in this regard. All right, so let's kind of go back and um, start now talking about type 2 errors. Um, get rid of that line. So let me draw this again. Oops, I didn't mean to uh, get our black pen for you. There we go. Um, so if we have um, the situation where in terms of the truth, <laughs> the null is false, and our statistical test, um, we have accepted the null. Here's our test. Check the null. And we said last time that this represents a type 2 error then, where we say, oh, X doesn't affect Y, but in fact it does. We're just missing it. So what could be the cause of that? Let's revisit this N issue. So um, we're doing our regression and we pick six points. What if they happen to be these six points? All right, and we do our regression and we find, whoop, there's no deviation of this slope from a slope of zero. Um, but what happens if we increase our sample size? And we find out, um, fill in the points. So we get closer and closer to the parametric population. We find, oh, x does in fact affect y. Now one can imagine picking six points out of here many times, and it would produce a slope of zero. But why is that? n was too small. So. Once again, we can improve our, cell, our situation 
by increasing n, we will make fewer type 2 errors as we increase n as well. So you might say, well, heck then, why don't we just always increase n? Well, it's, a, it's not a bad idea, except that um, we'll have limitations. So the reason we're sampling is that we can't sample the entire population. Now in the world of, you may have heard this jargon term that's thrown around a lot these days, the world of big data, um, we're getting closer and closer to parametric populations um, because we're able to access so much data. But um, uh, generally, when we're sampling and doing experiments, particularly expensive ones where we're testing blood and doing chemical tests or DNA tests or whatever, um, we're going to have a limited sample size. So are there any other ways that we could prevent ourselves from committing a type 2 error? We've, we've shown no difference. So let's imagine a regression again. Okay, just erase this. Let's go back to our regression. And you know where we are in that matrix. Let's imagine we're doing a regression of y versus x. And the, the points we choose, oops, the points we choose are here and here. Now, it's going to be hard to see a slope that's different from a slope of zero when you have points that are so close together, even when there is a pretty strong effect of x. So what can we do? We can add points that are farther away from the middle. In other words, we can strengthen our treatment effect. We can, in the case of analysis of variance, we could produce, for example, let's say we were producing a histogram and we were adding nitrogen. Well, we could have more nitrogen levels. So if we had, for example, 0.1 and 0.2 here, we could add a zero and we could add a 0.3 to spread out the nitrogen concentrations more so that we get a response. So whereas we may not have been able to see an effect of nitrogen, a difference in means between one and two, when we add groups zero and three, suddenly we can see them. Likewise, if we add points farther along the independent variables axis, we might be able to see a regression even with the same n. So one can imagine picking six points along that regression line, and it would be harder to pick six points along here at random that didn't show the line, right? So we are going to commit a type 2 error less often. So increasing the treatment levels, I might call it level breadth, okay, the, the strength of your treatments, the breadth of your treatments, is another really good way to guard against um, type 2 errors. So the number of levels was too small, or their spread was too small. Um, replication. Um, so here's, a, here's an interesting one. Um, Let's look back at our matrix again. Oops, here we go. All right, and so we have our stat test. And here we have our truth. And null is false. Uh, the null, oh sorry, the null is, I guess we have it down here. The null is false, the null is true. And our stat test says that it's true, and here we've rejected it. Okay. Um, one way to commit fewer type 2 errors is actually to increase your alpha. <laughs> okay, so change this over here so that these are now falling in the great range. And now we have fewer tests committing a type 2 error. And, and as we've already indicated kind of symmetrically, what that's going to do is it's going to increase the number of type 1 errors because now suddenly in this region we will be committing more type 1 errors. One way to, to think about these, I know it, it seems odd to sort of arbitrarily move between what's really the truth and what our statistical tests are showing because honestly in the real world all we have to go by is our statistical tests. But what I'm kind of telling you to think about is the relationship between the theoretical world here and um, are the world about which we can make inferences. This is our sample world.
and we're trying to learn about this theoretical world, okay? And we're trying to match up and always be in here um, so that we find out the truth. Um, so what we can do is we can move um, this line and uh, increase our probability of making of type 1, decrease our probability of making a type 2, or the other way around. Or we can work on experimental design. So kind of an overview, um, there are two ways, uh, overall ways, of attacking the problem of getting rid of type 1 and type 2 errors. And um, the experimental design issues we've talked about are increasing our n, so we get a much better fix on the parametric means, and that way we'll be less likely to make wrong inferences about them, but also about treatments. And so the treatments may need to be stronger, or we may need more of them. And all of those things are ways of improving our experimental design, uh, and they're often we're off, often uh, dealt with in science of uh, having constraints. So if we have, um, we say constraints limit our options here, um, but if we even within constraints, we can have a set, a set total number of, of uh, replicates that we can afford to do, but we can make the treatment stronger or we can make more treatments uh, in order to see the true underlying patterns better. Okay, so I realized that was a messy diagram, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Um, I kind of like this Gary Larson. Um, uh, cartoon because it emphasizes what I mentioned last time that um, despite everything we might want to do because of variable data errors are inevitable and I think um, you know as scientists that's a hard thing for us to deal with because we're always held to such a high standard for presenting only the truth and in that regard, it might be kind of behoove us to think about, in our particular field, which type of error are we most worried about? And I think that's better topic for a debating class, so I'm actually going to give you a um, uh, kind of a, a chance to debate this uh, in our classroom. But if you're watching out there in cyber world, um, you might want to think about that with respect to your particular field. Would you rather be a scientist that ends up um, never saying there's a difference when in fact, uh, or never saying there's a difference, so, or very rarely saying there's a difference, so moving your alpha level way low, um, but committing more type one errors, like type two errors, in other words, not finding differences when they really exist, or would you rather um, commit that kind of error or a balance between the two? And that's where, um, you know, different fields differ in terms of their acceptance of making these kinds of mistakes. But the basic bottom line is that if you do enough tests, and I think that's the way to think about it, you might get lucky for one, two, three, eight, twenty tests, but on the twenty-first test, if your alpha is 0.05, your probability is that you might make uh, a type 1 error. In fact, you might make type 2 errors. Okay? But we can do things about it with experimental design and um, by adjusting our alpha. Okay, complex, interesting topic to think about. Gets into the realm of philosophical, but I kind of like it for that reason. All right.